Happy Sabbath, church family. It's good to be back here at Parkwood. It's been a while since I've, my family has have been here. And uh, we're here today. I want to first of all thank God for the breath of life. Sometimes I refer to him as the landlord of breath. And we use his breath every time we inhale and we exhale. And sometimes we take it for granted. So right now I want to publicly say thank you, Lord, for the breath of life. I also say, say thank you to your pastor, Pastor John Talley, for asking me to stand in for him today. And so I am here, and I want to preach a word that hopefully you won't forget. And I bring you greetings from the two churches where I am the associate pastor, Ceres SDA Church, and the Patterson SDA Church. So greetings from those two churches as well. And so all of us who are watching at home or wherever we are, Welcome to the Parkwood SDA Church, and I hope you have been enjoying today's service as well, and you also enjoyed this message too. And of course, I'm happy to be with my family here, my wife Gerda of, of 13 years, about to be 14 years on Valentine's Day. Time is going by fast, and we have two young boys, Mythen and MJ. Mythen is 12, MJ is 8, and so uh, we're joined also by uh, my lifelong friend, Mrs. Uh, Debbie uh, Hudson. She's here with her two boys as well. And thank you for coming from Manteca area. And so uh, it's a wonderful thing to be in God's house. And so I want to uh, share with you a word today. And, and as is my custom, I like to uh, start off with some what I call sermon appetizers, okay? Sermon appetizers. Because throughout my 20 plus years of, of being a minister, preaching around uh, the different states wherever I, I, I've lived, I've noticed that sometimes people, God forbid, they forget what I preach about. And so I've come up with a little tactic where it's sermon appetizers. There are small nuggets that you may keep in your, in your mind, even though you may forget what I preach. Hopefully you don't forget. And so those of us who are here, those who are uh, watching online, here are some appetizers. So I want to begin this morning here. Get this, our first slide. Uh, let's see. It didn't move yet. Oh, it's behind me. Okay. I'm looking at both, though. So. Let's try this way. It's on green. Okay. Appetizer number one, make sure that you are happy in real life and not just on social media. People, uh, uh, years ago, I think it was 2008 or 2007 when smartphones were introduced to the population. And so you went from having a dumb phone to having a smartphone where your phone now had apps and you could do all different things with it. And then we had all the rise of all the different uh, tech, tech uh, companies came up. And so people now can, can uh, interact with people all across the globe with just their phone or their iPad or whatever they had, a tablet. But then also I would see for some, there was a craze where people were always showing a picture of their food. I, I, I don't understand. You, you sit down at a restaurant to eat your meal with, with, with your spouse or whoever you're with, and you would take a picture and post it and say, here's what I'm eating at Red Lobster. Here's what I'm eating at Red Robin. Okay, eat your food. But well, people, people, people want to showcase everything. But what I also realized was people mostly, I'd say 90%, always put the highlights of their day, of their week. You're on the beach in Cancun, you put a picture, your feet up in a cabana, you put a picture. I'm living up, living my best life. Okay? You're at a graduation, wherever you are, you put those pictures up, and the world who is following you sees you're a happy person. Your life is so nice. Make sure you're happy in real life and not just on social media. Remember, I learned this years ago, between happiness and joy. Happiness comes from what happens to you. 
But joy is a state of being. You get a raise, you're happy. You, uh, you graduate, you're happy. Okay, but can you have joy in the midst of a bad time in your life? if you know who you are serving. Happiness is contingent on what happens to you, but joy is a way of life. And one person also showed me this too, the way you have joy, J-O-Y, J, Jesus first, O, others second, Y, yourself last. And that's biblical. Bible says if you're not humble, God will humble you. And the Bible says if you are humble, God will lift you up. The Ten Commandments, they have two divisions. The first four, the last six. The first four are between you and God. The last six are between you and others. When you put them together, then that's why you now can have joy in your life. Make sure you are happy in real life and not just on social media. Appetizer number two. Dirty water doesn't stop plants from growing. So don't let negative words stop your progress. Not everyone who smiles in your face is your friend. Dirty water doesn't stop plants from growing. So don't let people's dirty thoughts or dirty words stop your progress. Some people aren't happy that you got that raise or that you found a spouse and they're still single. They're not happy about that. Your kids are on the honor roll and theirs aren't. They're not, they may be smiling in your face, but you don't know. That's why the Lord is where your joy is grounded in. Because even when you lose your job, you can say, Lord, you know where I will be next. Yes, it hurts. You get some bad news from the physician. Yes, it hurts. But the God in heaven has a life beyond these 100 years we have on life on earth if we have 100 years. Because let me tell you this, people. I tell it to Patterson, to Siri, wherever I go. And I want to make it clear to you, when you go to a memorial service or a funeral and you look at the program, the person's face is there and you have the date that they were born, the date that they died, and what's in the middle of those two dates? A little hyphen, a dash, about an inch long. So that person could, that person could, could have been 95 years old, but their whole life is in that one inch. So God is saying, what I learn is, God is saying, give me that one inch and I will give you an unending life of no pain, no trials, no gray hairs, no canes, no wheelchairs. Give me that time, the time between the day of birth and the day of death. Now, the Bible said there'll be some of us who won't see death because we'll be alive when Christ comes. And so we'll never have to go through that. Our family won't have to cry at our funeral. Praise God for that. But the time you have that you're breathing, give it to God. We have to be careful about that. Don't let the people who are around you mess with you. These are our appetizers, people. Our appetizers. Appetizer number three, know the difference between those who stay to feed the soil and those who come to grab the fruit. Once again, everybody who smiles in your face is not your friend. I didn't come here today to give a happy sermon. I came to preach. Hopefully, you will hear what God is saying to you throughout the scripture we're going to use today. I hope so. But know the difference between those who stay to feed the soul, those who are with you before that promotion. They're helping you get through month by month. 
And those who come after you have that big house. You have the Bentley, the Benz. Now they want to say, how you doing? Oh, oh, oh. They want to come and have a big smile. But when you were struggling, they were nowhere to be found. And the truth is, some of us are those type of people. You don't want to befriend someone who has less than you. You have a PhD, they have a GED, you don't want to talk to them. You can't, you're not in my class. You're over there with those people until one day they can help you out. And now you drop the PhD, I need your help. Just because you have a title doesn't mean you're entitled. People, please. This world that we live in is short. The life we have is short. Use it wisely. And so I want us to now get ready. We're going to go into our message. I want to read the scripture reading. And I'm going to go into our sermon. Matthew 16, 24. Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and a follow me. Let's pause today as we pray and look at this message entitled, Follow Me. Loving Lord, we pause today as we open your book to take a look. Help us to glean some principles that we can hold fast unto and share with others. This, this I do pray that the people of God say it together, Amen. Amen. And so we go I only have a few slides with you. DTR, you know, when, uh, when you are dating somebody, you know, uh, let's say you're, you passed the high school age, you've been past the college, and now you're in your mid-20s. You have a degree, you have a career, and you, both of you are in your careers, and you're dating somebody. After six months, it's still, oh, how you doing, whatever. After a year, it starts to get like, okay, we are in our mid to what, 25 plus. We're in our career, going to date for a year. The woman mind is thinking. The women are here. After a year, you're in your, you are, you are whatever you were, a teacher, you're a nurse, you're, you're a counselor, you whatever you are. And this guy's been, then you for a year, two years, DTR. What's that supposed to mean? Define the relationship. Do you really want to be with me or just for fun? DTR. At some point, the man, the way that the world has made it, society, the man has to, at some point, have a day and go up to his girlfriend. Somewhere, wherever, the park, whatever. But the point is, at some point, he has to ask that woman, you know, honey, uh, been a, since you came to my life, uh, the world has been a better place, etc. And then he'll have that one line, will you marry me? And the women are always waiting for that one line. Now he has defined the relationship. Where am I going with this? Well, there comes a time in one's Christian walk with Jesus when one must define the relationship. In other words, we must answer the question, am I a follower of Jesus or a fan of Jesus? Am I a follower of Jesus or a fan of Jesus? I want to break that down to you this afternoon. 
a fan. A fan can be described as an enthusiastic admirer. Uh, fans wear the jerseys, uh, I have signed posters, bumper stickers, but never get on the field or the court. A fan knows all about the players, but doesn't know the players. After a while, if the team disappoints them, they may even switch teams. An enthusiastic admirer, as long as you're making me feel good, I'm with you. But once things turn around, I'm going to stop spending money on you. I'm a fan. Let's make it real close now. As long as that beauty doesn't fade, I'm with you. But once things start to sag, peace out. Or the, other, or the other way, as long as you can support me with, with your, that nice house, I'm with you. But if you lose that job, and we, can't, we have to move to a smaller house, peace out. I'm a fan. How are we with Jesus? A fan continued, the woman who never misses the celebrity shows. She's current with the latest People magazine. She's a fan of a particular actress and knows all of her movies. She knows everything about her favorite actress. However, she doesn't know the actress. Fans of Jesus know all about him, but they don't know him. This is from a book I read called Not a Fan by Kyle Adelman. It's an awesome book. Not a fan. He suggests we should not be fans of Jesus. We need to be followers. You know, it is a thing that when you live on this earth and you see a couple of decades go by, some of you have seen multiple decades go by, and you see how it goes up and down in your life. And you can look at yourself and say, am I a fan or a follower? Am I fickle or am, do I have a foundation? And Jesus wants some, us to DTR, define the relationship, because Jesus himself said, I love you so much, I'm going to leave glory to come to this tiny planet to put on human skin, let you guys kill me so you have a chance to live with me forever. That's commitment. But on our side, how far are we willing to go? How uncomfortable will we get before we say enough. And if you say enough, what's the point? Enough meaning what? I'd rather play with the devil and be on his side? And after my 90 years or 100 years are over, that's it and that's it? Because I always ask myself the question. We have the side of the people saying atheists, and those who are saying Christians, they believe in God and Jesus. Both take faith. You're an atheist. You believe that a big bang happened millions of years ago, and we came out of nowhere from monkeys, apes, doing like, and all of a sudden we came along, and now we're up like this straight, and now we can walk and drive cars and fly planes. Or you believe that there's a God who said, let there be, and boom, there was light, land, trees, flowers, water, and all of a sudden he created a, a dirt man. Adam means dirt man, and he breathed that, that dirt man here with the life, and Adam woke up and named the animals, and, and, and Adam went back to sleep, and he built Eve from Adam's rib. Either one requires faith, because we weren't there for either one of them. So 
would you rather believe that there was monkeys and they all of them all of a sudden they were like this and then all of a sudden they're like this and like this and now they're talking hey hi 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 and now you're talking and now they can talk and put clothes on and build things define the relationship because if the Christians are wrong and there is no Jesus what's their worst outcome they die, it's over. But if the atheists are wrong, and they said, wow, if I would have believed in Jesus, I could have a life forever with no aches and pains. I'm missing out on all of that. Put it on a scale. Put it on a scale. If we're wrong, when we die, it's over. There's no crack on back, it's over. But on the other side, if they're wrong, they missed out on what Christ is offering. Life eternal. Life eternal. So we have this. Now we have our next slide coming up real quick. A follower. A follower can be described as one who commits daily to be like Jesus. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I like these three words in that verse. I die daily. What does that mean, I die daily? That means every day I die to my selfish ambitions, my selfish agenda, my selfish plan. You wake up, Lord, what do you have for me today? Follow the Lord's agenda for you every day. I die daily because every day the devil's after each one of us. But thank God that the Lord never sleeps or slumbers either. But we have to choose God. That's the, that's the twist there. We have to choose God. He will not force himself to be our Lord. But when we choose him, the devil has to back out and get far from us. Amen. Boom, boom, boom. But when we don't choose the Lord, the devil now has a chance to keep on bugging us. He keeps on tempting us. He cannot force us to do what he wants, but he keeps on tempting us. And he has what we call custom-made temptation. He watched us from our birth and sees our tendencies, and he has custom-made temptations. Some will be tempted by a short skirt, and some won't. But he knows each of us how we live. So he'll craft temptations just for us, hoping that we would fall for it. It's not a sin to be tempted because Christ was tempted. The sin is, when you don't rely on Christ and you fall for it. But you have not died daily. And as you see this screen, the rest of this slide, followers allow Jesus to turn their lives upside down, not just make minor changes. We allow Christ to turn our lives upside down not just make minor changes. We make complete renovations, not just touch-up work. You ever see those shows where they have to tear down this house to make it look better? They can't just fix it. It's been infested, asbestos, as mold, as whatever. They bring the bulldozer and bring it and remake a new one. That's what Christ has to do with some of us. But we, we want Christ to just make a, just make a touch-up. You can't do a touch-up with the mold. You gotta take it out. It's not about touch-ups. Make complete remodel, not simply decorating. 
Ever heard that? Ever heard that expression? You can't put lipstick on a pig. You can't put lipstick on a pig. It's a pig. It still wants to go in the dirt and the mud and lay around and put his mouth in the mud. It's a pig. You can't put lipstick on a pig. Someone want to have a same treacherous life, but just look good on Sabbath morning. Shower. Put the foundation, put the, all the nice uh, makeup, put a cologne on, tie. I'll be Sabbath. And we're good for a few hours. We're here looking good. Haircuts, nice bangs, whatever you got. And looking good. Lipstick on a pig. I have a saying that I see wherever I go 24 7, not 7 11. We ought to be Christians 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and not just on the seventh day at 11 a.m. Some of us are Christians on the seventh day at 11 a.m. because that's when we have worship hour. So it's holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, but the rest of the week is demon, demon, demon. Who knows what was said in the car when y'all were driving here to church? When you parked and walked in the corridor, it's time to put on Jesus. Have the Marlins here? Have you have you have it? But in the car, who knows what was said to your, to your spouse or to the kids? Or Thursday or Wednesday. That's why I die daily, Paul said. And we should do the same thing. Help me, Lord, for this day to, to live the life that you want me to live. Followers allow Jesus to interfere in their lives, not just inspire them. You ever go on YouTube and you see uh, how to fix your closet? There's like 100 videos. You click on one and it shows, Do this. that's inspiration. But until you say, I'm going to clean that closet out and do what that person is showing me, it's just inspiration. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. I, 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 I can go to a Dollar Tree and, and uh, 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 buy these boxes here and put this here, put this here. But until you say, today I'm going to do it, that closet stays raggedy. That garage, whatever it is, you want to lose 25 pounds? They say, if you eat three donuts a day, eat, eat one donut, but those three donuts taste so good, you will have a morning or a night until you make a change. You'll stay where you are. And this is, when he says, follow me, there are things we have to understand we're not supposed to be fans of Jesus. And when I look at this, Many of us know hymns, but don't know him. Claire, we're coming here and play all these nice songs, and we're singing these songs because we've sung them for, for 30 years. How about this? Do we know more of these or more of this? When you came to church this morning, when you were leaving your house to go to your car, did, you, did anybody do something like this? I must walk in church with my Bible because this is where we have our Bibles. Now, to be fair, we have these Bibles too. So if you're into this, that's great because we can highlight in there. That's awesome. My, my whole point is put God's word in here and in here. That will change your life. So now we live in an age since 07, smartphones, so now we can live a different way. That's fine. Get God's word into you. So now, a few slides left. I'm going to go through these. Let's see here. Not going. Next slide is not going to go. I 
Press the wrong one. Okay. Anyone means everyone. In that verse we read, Matthew 6 and 24, Jesus begins the invitation with the two words, if anyone. Anyone is an all-inclusive word which signifies everyone. In other words, Jesus Christ is inviting everyone to follow him, regardless if you're divorced, ex-con, alcoholic, Republican, Democrat, an addict, hypocrite, and fill in the rest. Because Christ's blood was spilt for anyone and everyone who ever breathed. We have to remove our excuses and say, Lord, whether I accept you or not, you are true. No more time for excuses. Everyone, anyone can be replaced for everyone. Everyone. Because that's how it is. Then, that's our verse again, then Jesus told the disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Remember that? Deny himself. I die daily. Deny himself. Take up his cross. And follow me. Our last slide. Let's follow Jesus, church. Jesus isn't interested in fans because they only know about him and aren't in the warfare with him. I have this saying. I'm going to say it here again this morning. But also, Jesus is interested in followers who will deny themselves, take up their crosses, and allow him to lead them into leading others to follow him unto salvation. We can't take this gospel and be stingy with it. We have to share it. And when we were having children's story here, there probably were 20 kids up here, probably more, and they were giving the story out. And I was sitting there watching the children's story. I love all these kids up here. But only two of them are going to go into my Highlander when church is over. Only two will go home with me. And those two are the ones who are my children. The ones who look like me. What are you saying, Pastor Marlon? Of course you only have two boys. Go home with them. Christ loves all eight billion of us on earth. He loves all of us. But when he returns, he will come back for his children. And who are children? The ones who look like him. Love your enemies. Feed those who are hungry. Clothe the naked. Return tithe and offer. Etc., etc., etc. Nahum 1 9, sin won't arise a second time. So that means the reason why he'll come back for those who look like him is because the ones who don't look like him may start sin again. But in Christ's loving heart, even the ones who are not saved, will not suffer eternal hellfire. And how do I know that? Because the one famous verse in the whole Bible, John 3.16, let's parse that verse before we close. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Should, should what? Should not perish perish, but have everlasting life. That means that those who don't believe in him shall perish. God is saying everlasting life is reserved for the ones that are saved. Other religions teach that you will have a hellfire forever. The only way to burn in hell forever is to have everlasting life. 
because God's the one who gives life. So the only way to burn hell forever is for God to give you everlasting life. But he says right there, those who believe shall not perish. So that gives comfort to me, even though those who are against the Lord won't have to burn in hell forever. They will burn and they will die. But God is saying, I want followers, not fans. It's appeal time, church. You're thinking about your life. Are you a fan or a follower of Jesus? Is it Christ's way or is it your way in your life? Lord, help us to make sure that we are followers of you. If you're a fan, I implore you to pray to God and say, Lord, help me to be a follower. Because enough of the charades, enough of the games, it has to be your way or no way. And so I ask, that as we think about our lives, think about Matthew 16, 24. Follow after Jesus. And if not, when Christ comes again, he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. But if you're a follower, he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So I pray that we will understand this word this morning and Tell the world about this man named Jesus who is God and who will come back. May we follow him in all our days. Let us pray. Loving Lord, we pause today as we end this service. We pray, Lord, that we will be followers of you and you will order our steps each day of our lives. May we die daily as Paul states in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31, and each day follow your agenda, your blueprint for what we ought to do. Bless Parkwood in a special way. Bless their Pastor John. And may we all meet again on that great day when you return. This is my prayer. Let's just say together, amen.